Hello all and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 220th New Social Environment. I'm Anya Bernstein, a production assistant at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and the privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between sculptor Sally Saul and Rail's senior writer and editor at large, Jason Rosenfeld. We're also thrilled to have the poet Julian Poirier here, who will read to close today's program. To begin, I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation, the traditional owners of Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters on which we stand. Finally, the Brooklyn Rail stands in solidarity with the uprisings in response to the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, David McGatty, James Skurlock, Jamil Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Rayshard Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Remy Fells, Toyin Salau, Walter Wallace Jr., and countless others who we have lost to white supremacy and police violence in this country. And we acknowledge that justice will come from the streets, from the nation demanding accountability and refusing to move on until Black Lives Matter in the eyes of the state. Before I introduce our guests, we'd like to begin with a brief moment of silence. Thank you. Uh, and now to introduce our guests. Sally Saul earned a BA from the University of Colorado and an MA in American Literature from the San Francisco State University, where she graduated in 1973. During her time in California, she became acquainted with the Bay Area visual arts movement, characterized by a penchant for bright colors and an interest in drawing subject matter from day to day life. In the early 1980s, Saul relocated to Austin where she enrolled in ceramics courses at the University of Texas and began to formalize her process. Informed by memory, her sculptures came to explore complexities of the human condition. Her first survey exhibition, Blue Hills, Yellow Tree, opened in May 2019 at Pioneer Works in Brooklyn, New York. Saul presented a solo show at Almin Rec, Paris in January 2020. In 2018, the artist with Peter Saul co-curated the exhibition Out of Control at Venus over Manhattan, New York. Saul lives and works in Germantown, New York. And Jason Rosenfeld, PhD, is Distinguished Chair and Professor of Art History at Marymount Manhattan College. He was co-curator of the exhibitions John Everett Millay, Pre-Raphaelites, Victorian Avant-Garde, and River Crossings. He's a senior writer and editor at large for the Brooklyn Rail. So without further ado, Jason, take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Anya. Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you also to um, Nick for helping to arrange this, and uh, in advance to Julian, our poet who's with us today, who we'll hear from later, um, and uh, at the gallery, Maya Blumenberg uh, Taylor, who helped us out with preparing material for today's talk. And uh, welcome to Sally Saul and her constant and beloved com companion, married for, I think, 46 years. Is that right, Sally? Yeah. yeah, is that right? Peter Saul, Peter Saul. Um, Peter Saul, uh, who just had an exhibition at the new museum titled Crime and Punishment, which closed on uh, January 3rd, three days before the storming of the Capitol. So we need another exhibition called Crime and Punishment. <laughs> right. It just goes on and on yeah. and on. Um, more more uh, fodder for you to paint with. Although, as I understand, you're done with painting Trump. Um, and Sally, of course, has a wonderful exhibit right now at uh, Rachel Upton Gower, which we'll talk about, but welcome to you two. They're coming at you live from Columbia County, New York. I'm coming to you from the West Village and the uh, Brooklyn Rail team is spread out throughout all the boroughs uh, from uh, uptown in Harlem through Brooklyn <laughs> and parts around and in between. Yeah, um, we're bringing this to you live every day. This is number 220. I'm gonna share the screen and bring up some images. See number 220, holy moly. Wow, 220, yeah. yeah, 220 in a row. Since March Amazing. I think it's 17th or 18th, something like that. We've been going strong every single weekday. It's yeah. a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It doesn't feel like it though. It's moving quick. So uh, here's just the website, the webpage from Rachel Uffner Gallery, which is down on the Lower East Side uh, in beautiful light drenched environs on uh, Suffolk Street, 170. Suffolk Street, there's uh, great stuff around there. Uh, I had breakfast one day at the Peace Cafe, 
um, which I could plug easily. Um, it's right around the corner from where I got my first uh, COVID vaccination. So it's become a special area for me. Um, it's up through January 30th, which is this weekend. So I encourage you all to go see it. There is uh, just a view from the gallery and one more image and then we'll start to chat um, here on the left. Uh, Maya from the gallery helpfully served as a model to give us a sense of scale because it's very important to understand how large um, Sally's works are and how they relate to you bodily uh, in the gallery. So Sally, welcome and congratulations on a really beautiful and intriguing and thought-provoking show. Thank you, thank you. You're welcome. It's titled In the Woods, In the Woods. And just for expediency, as you see here on the screen, I wrote that all the works are from this past year and we'll talk a bit about that, uh, or last year, I should say, sorry, 2020. And they're all made of clay and glaze, except for one work, which has some additional materials, which you'll see. And of course, the title In the Woods made me immediately think of Into the Woods, uh, the great uh, American standard now musical, uh, music and lyrics by Stephen Sondheim and book by James Lapine, uh, opened on Broadway in 1987. Um, and then uh, I think the first one I saw was 2002 with the great Vanessa Williams, uh, and then a roundabout theater production in 2015, a much smaller production. But Sally, have you seen the play multiple times? No, I haven't. We haven't seen it, you know. Um, you know, we tend not to go to the theater as much as I think we would like, um, uh, just because of, you know, uh, the you mechanics know, of it. Well, not only the mechanics of it, but you know, we tend to go to see art shows and museums and oh, so God, on. And, yes. and so that, but we should make more of a point of doing that really. Um, don't you think? Theater gives a lot more usually. Yeah. Yeah, it can, it um, can, it's true. It's a particularly wonderful play. It's a kind of collation of fairy tales and it's mm -hmm. about parent-child relationships and one's duty to the community. I mean, it's consistently relevant um, and has a great, great score. Um, but, you know, the exhibition that you have up at the gallery has the kind of feeling of sort of navigating through a wood with all these plinths with different mm -hmm. works. And of course, there are a number of them that are connected to nature, as we'll see, which relates to some, uh, some domestic gardening that Sally has been up to in, uh, in Germantown. <laughs> A little bit. Um, and there's de there is a predilection for birds in this exhibition uh, as well, as you're going to see. But there are a wonderful, extraordinary array of heads and faces and figures often in distress um, or discombobulated. Look at the glasses on the figure at the bottom right. And I thought we just might start with some of these details. And you can see how expressive uh, Sally's faces are, heads are, I should say. And the animals are, are no different. The birds similarly have a kind of innate sense of, I don't even know if we want to call it humanity, but organic uh, sort of vitality maybe. But, you know, this is something which sort of really struck me. And, and to be honest, I had not seen much of the work previously, Sally. So this was my first real, um, real interconnection uh, with the pieces. But you know, do you feel like there's a general theme in the show? Well, I think the general theme would be, uh, yeah, I think the 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 emphasis on um, being distressed, under stress, um, hoping to survive, um, and I, I, to some degree, I, I guess the birds share in that too because we're losing a huge number of them. Um, what was it? Four billion, or so, I believe, in fifty years. So, um, uh, yes. So I think we're, that there's that's what connects it really, is um, the sense of a very stressful time, and how we navigate through that, and um, hopefully survive it, and um, create something better along the way. We hope. Mm. I mean, the faces are, are so varied and the one here, second from the left at the top, transformed is the most <laughs> extreme one and yeah. the most humorous one. Um, she's been in a fight maybe. Yeah. Yeah, she's been, you should see the other person. But she still has, um, yeah, she still has her necklace, you know. <laughs> so. She still has her necklace and, you know, I think it's the little details like that, the necklace, 
the single earring on the woman here uh, at the left. This is the standing figure that I'm showing you detail of. Um, the title is uh, is caution, caution um, here. Uh, and you know these little elements like the material in the eagle's mouth, which we'll talk about. The birds uh, really do have consumption as a theme, consuming material. Um, you see that sort of consistently, and uh, this idea of uh, you know being in distress or thinking about it. But maybe it feels a little bit lifted now. Do you feel a little bit lighter now? Well, in yes. the Joe Biden era. I do. I do. I did. <laughs> It sort of goes day by day, you know, according mm -hmm. to what happens, I guess. Um, so, uh, I mean, like I was, I mean, I was reading um, this morning about, um, you know, Mitch McConnell freezing the Senate committees um, yeah. and so on and so forth. And I just thought, well, why don't they just, why don't the Democrats just make up new committees? I mean, I just <laughs> you know, just go around them somehow, like a detour or something, you know, I don't know, at any rate. So, yeah, so there's, it, it goes back and forth, you know, I mean, mm. uh, I, you know. Do you feel like you don't have to be on top of the news 24 hours a day anymore? Mm. That not not as much, no, no, I know. She is on top of the news. Well, not like I used to be, you know, in this, mm. a, a year ago, I mean, in, Last spring, it, it was such a panicky situation with the virus um, surging and not, you know, we were all learning like how to deal with it, like, you know, to um, wipe every knob and handle and everything, you know, right. <laughs> and it became kind of obsessive after a while. And um, then how to wear a mask and how, how to get it on and where to order them from and to get on Amazon and all of that. Um, yeah. Just um, kind of lived inside of you. And so I, that's when I really did start, um, you know, reading the times more diligently, I guess. And um, also um, appreciated Cuomo. I started listening to his daily briefing um, at that, during that, segment of months um, because he was the only one who seemed to be able to describe what was happening clearly and um, emphatically and give you some sense of comfort, mm -hmm. reassurance that we were addressing this, you know. Um, I mean, he, it, you know, he hasn't been too great with the rollout of the vaccine, but, you know, I, really appreciated him during those few months. Um, and especially since Trump was always doing this crazy stuff like that we should inject ourselves with disinfectant and so on. So yeah. it was helpful yeah. to have a voice of reason <laughs> that you could yeah, listen. My, my wife still listens to him every day and yeah, he's a straight shooter. He's just trying to yeah. tell you what's happening. Yeah. And in a way it's, it's kind of comfort. It is, it is a comfort in, in the midst of all the disinformation, I think. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Do you, um, you know, do, were all these works made since March? Um, yeah, I guess they were. Yep. Right, they were. Okay. So you've been very busy, <laughs> Sally. You think so? You're making a lot of works. Yeah, I it mean, there's a lot like of works. And, to me, you know. Ah, well, I don't know. Well, we'll talk a, little bit, a bit about your process okay. as we go through. But I mean, I was amazed at both how many works there were and how varied they are. They're quite extraordinary because some, as everyone will see who has not seen the show yet, which includes the artist and P Peter, I know you two haven't been down there to see it, um, but you know, th there's works that have a sense of environment. This one, for example, the wonderful Troubled Waters, which ha it, it establishes an environment around uh, the figure. This woman is in an inner tube in her, uh, in her bathing costume. And uh, bring, get closer, and you see these waves, like like hands, sort of reaching out to envelop her, hug her, drown her, uh, and her hands. The wonderful bit with it splayed out in front of her, each of the fingernails visible and painted. And you know, you, it, there's a cartoonish element to this, but of course, she has five fingers, uh, you know, a thumb and four fingers, unlike Homer Simpson. There's it, there's a naturalism that is always inherent in all of these sculptures, and I love the way that you portray the teeth because teeth 
are the marker of realism. I'm my technically I'm an expert in Victorian art, British mm -hmm. painting, and one of the pre-Raphaelite artists, Ford Maddox Brown, always showed teeth in his paintings and the critics went ballistic because the critics always go ballistic, except for the <laughs> critics from the rail who are supportive and interpretive. But um, the critics went crazy because they're like, why do we want to look at these people's teeth? And Maddox <laughs> Brown was like, well, when you look at someone and they're talking or they're screaming, you see their teeth. It's a, nat it's a natural thing. And the teeth here sort of chattering uh, are a wonderful element of this, as this woman is being sort of enveloped by these waves. Uh, is this a, a new composition? Something very different than you've done it, before? It is a new composition. And uh, I do, I like, uh, I like this piece myself um, actually. And, you know, it just, sometimes um, the idea comes easily and um, executing the idea comes easily. And this was a piece in which that happened. Um, it just all came together and, um, so, uh, you know, and the waves too, you know, at first I was going to have taller waves kind of looming mm -hmm. over her, but I felt after a while that wasn't gonna work. So I changed it and made them smaller and encompassing her like they are. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes. And there's, there's marvelous bits like the hair, which effectively conveys that idea of plumped wet hair that is what it is. It looks exactly like that. Um, and the big eyes, the big eyes, which are so human, they really draw you in. And I purposely, you know, I, I know you weren't there. You might talk a little bit about the installation because I know you weren't there to do it. But the height of the plinths seems to be really important. I want to go back to that photo of Maya in the galleries so people can see. Some are quite low. Some are a little bit higher. Yes, yeah, some things you see head on, eye to eye, like that standing figure in the back left of the image who I showed you the detail of, caution here. You're sort of eye to eye with her. But others you look down onto. Um, and it, it really changes your perception of each of the works. So when you're looking at um, troubled waters, you know, being able to look down at her and, and feeling her distress is, is really uh, assaultive in a way in a, it brings it very vividly into focus. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, I know. And that's, all, you know, that's always baffles me too. I'm, I'm not very good at installing myself, I don't think. Um, I'm never sure about just how high it should be. I'm, and um, so I really appreciate the installation that they did because I think it works very well. And you know, I think you just really have to have experience in an eye for how to do it. Um, mm -hmm. I think museums often hang things or install things too high. Um, if you go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, 19th yeah. century wing, everything is too high. I used to go to museums with my Grammy, grandmother Ruth, uh, my mom's mom when I was, when she was still alive and she was quite short and she had shrunk over my lifetime. And we used to go to shows and that, you know everything was too high for her. She couldn't see them. So when things are lower, it mm -hmm. always seems to make sense to me. Um, I think it does. And it really you does. engage with it in a different way. Sorry, go ahead. No, I agree with you on that because you know, you don't wanna be looking up at the knees or something. Um, and yeah. so it is important to have them lower down. I agree, absolutely. Yeah, you're not in the Sistine Chapel after all. <laughs> yeah, at, right. at art. Yeah. yeah we can't. We can't get much closer than that. Um, but that there's, a, there's also a very expressive use, I would say, of both the material of the clay and mm -hmm. also a kind of judicious use of glaze um, mm -hmm. in the work. Mm -hmm. it, none of the works are covered in glaze. So there's that shininess, uh, which often you associate with ceramics, is not there. There's a real haptic, rough quality to these pieces. And it's almost like the difference between a painting which is heavily glazed, either with varnish or with mm -hmm. glass, mm -hmm. which you can't really connect with. And these sculptures, because they feel so kind of intentionally rough, it feels like you can uh, connect with them in well, a more human way. Part of that is, is the uh, clay body itself, um, which has quite a bit of grog in it. Um, grog is, is um, fired clay that's been ground up into small particles. Um, and if you add it to the clay body, it helps to strengthen it. And it's, um, 
Mm. It's less likely to crack. So it's helpful um, with larger pieces to have a good strong yeah. clay body that you can do that with. And um, because I mean, had, it dries more quickly problem with cracking. So I, I had mm. this made up, you know, from a formula. Does it dry more quickly when you use the grog? I don't think so. Um, hmm. I guess, well, maybe a little bit more quickly, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. But um, primarily you don't have to worry about it as much, you know, um, mm -hmm. if, it, if it's a large piece and you put it in the kiln, I mean, it can take a lot of um, uh, stress, basically, okay. much more stress if you have, have, have some grog mixed in with it. And right. so you don't have to worry so much about cracking and... Right. Um, is the figure here one piece? It is. Mm -hmm. Okay. One piece then with the waves around. And the waves everyone can see are painted and then uh, you know, they have a, a different kind of texture. <laughs> here is a view of the front room at Rachel Efner Gallery on Suffolk Street. And you could see at the far left, the work that we just looked at, uh, Troubled Waters. And then in the foreground is a, a wonderful piece uh, which is called Assault. It doesn't have <laughs> such a happy-go-lucky title, uh, but it, I find it to be a very ebullient piece, as we'll see. And on the right, there's a work called Untitled, which we'll look at as well. But uh, on the right here, this is Assault. It's an image of two pots uh, who are in a contretemps. Um, here's a detail uh, on the left, and you can see the, the use of glaze and the use of, this is a glazed slip on the left there, the shiny paint. Well, it's uh, actually, it's, uh, I, use, I use quite a bit of an underglaze, a commercial underglaze, um, a velvet underglazes, Amico velvet, uh -huh. and they're really great. They, they're, they come in, there's a wide range of colors. They have some fantastic colors and you can also mix them like you would with paint. Um, so you can make combinations of colors too, which is good. So, um, that's what I've primarily used on, on these two vases. Um, and I added some myelica, which is a glaze with a white um, along the rim of this vase. And so- On the left one, as well, on as, the left I'll show one, you yeah. in detail. I'll show you detail here, how's that? So cool. Yeah. You can see it there, so the white yeah along the lip of the one here. I've, I've walked around the back of it, so there are two views of it, obviously. But looking down at it, you can see those, those dots, which um, ring it almost like pearls around the top lip. Um, so, you know, it, it, go ahead, sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say, so this was another piece that just sort of popped into my mind. I was thinking, you know, mm -hmm. um, of there's so much uh, anger and, kind of assaulting, uh, verbal assaulting, at least um, mm. at, at the time I was making these. Um, I mean, I'm thinking of all the rants and raves by you know who <laughs> every day. Right. And so, or, to, or talking heads on cable news. Or talking each other. heads or the Proud Boys or whoever, you know. Um, mm. so, so I just thought, well, why not have two vases, you know? Um, uh, one more or less the victim than the other doing the assaulting. So, and That's an idea. I don't know, it just kind of, it just came to me as an idea, you know? Yeah, I think of them as two vases or two pots that have been sitting together on a shelf for so long and finally they just go at it. They just can't yeah. take being next to each <laughs> other enough. any longer and they just go at it. And I, it reminded me being the art historian of a couple of, a yeah. couple of works from the history of art, uh, the one on the right uh, which I think relates to some of your interest in uh, animals. Franz Marc, right. of course, a member of Die Brücke in Dresden um, in uh, the early 20th century in Germany, uh, fighting forms, this extraordinary work where you have all these different animals forms, and uh, really like eagles with talons who are attacking each other, but it's really a clash of colors. Mm -hmm. And also a work that I know you have spoken about, or oh, yes, at least yeah. Peter, Peter let out of the bag in another uh, Zoom that you two did. Uh, by Maria Martins, the, the terrific Brazilian mm -hmm. surrealist, this one called The Impossible Three, which is at MoMA um, from 1946. Maria Martins, who um, is a, a really interesting figure, and she also, uh, fun fact, 
was the model for Duchamp's Etant Donné uh, in the Philadelphia Museum of Art, that last sculpture that Duchamp did model? with the, the woman <laughs> lying in the yeah, I don't know any the nude know. woman lying in the wilderness. Yes, you got to look behind that wood door at the Philadelphia Museum of Art to see it. They had an affair for a long time. Um, and on the right, Maria Martin's extraordinary work, which seems like something out of modern science fiction films of these two forms uh, that are just seem to be uh, attacking each other with talons or, or teeth. Very basic. It has that same mm -hmm. feel. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, very basic. That was um, in, at MoMA. Um, remember they had a, a yeah, yeah. rearrangement of their work. Yeah, yeah. That was, was the last prominent. time we went to MoMA before yeah. the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So have you been up in uh, Germantown all, the whole time? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. We went in yeah. one time uh, when the situation was better. That was around, when was it? Early September? Maybe. You know, when, when the um, pandemic had abated somewhat. And yeah. we went in and had another look at Peter's show mm -hmm. um, at the new museum and a few other shows. And um, we ate outside with some friends and that was- Dangerous enough. <laughs> yeah. But you know, it felt so great. It just felt so great to be there. And, um, but we haven't been back since. No. So we're looking forward to it. And you know, the museums are open, but they're very quiet. Uh, it puts me in two minds. I went to the Met um, uh, yesterday and it was really empty. And for contemplation of the works, it's unparalleled, right? But for the the purse and the pulse of the institution, mm -hmm. it's really bad. Um, mm -hmm. You know, no tourists, very little, very few people there. Yeah. Uh, but if people can get to the museums, it's very safe. It felt like, and yeah. God, there's just a lot of elbow room to yeah. see the work. It's a good time to go in some ways, I guess. Yeah, yeah. in some yeah. ways. Yeah, I mean, but the other, the sad thing is that many of the galleries are empty because. The, cha the traveling exhibitions, which they have up to 15 at a time, right? Are just not there. They're not getting yeah. loan shows. Anymore. Yeah, yeah, that's terrible. On the other hand, art, you might feel really stupid if you died because you wanted to look at art. How would that be, uh, you know what I mean? That is right, true, that is true. Like the last five minutes and it's because you had to see some art. <laughs> You had oh, to see that Jacques Louis David one more time. That was it. <laughs> no, but I, you know the thing is, I, the thing is about the city. At least, I mean, everyone's wearing, wearing masks. People are bringing. I know quite they're very about good it. about that, and they're very careful in the galleries about um, yeah. not any crowding yeah. or you know yeah. just yeah. only That's so true. many people at a time. Yeah, and they so put in new atmospheric systems. Anywhere, probably. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. true. So the last work in the front room is this one, which is the most curious to my mind in the whole show. Uh, it's helpfully, helpfully called Untitled. And um, it's, a, it's, a sort of, uh, it's a sort of exploding conical form uh, drenched with uh, paint coming down it. As you can all see, it's, it's the largest work, I think, in the exhibition. Um, it is fully in the round and is very different from every angle. Um, material popping off of it. There's a flower that's sort of trying to poke out uh, from the lava of the top. There's a little, I don't know, there's booties here. It's like, this is, you know, stockings hung for Christmas. Um, there's a lot, there's a spider. There's a lot going on. It's quite wondrous. But let me just put up the next image. Oh, look at this. Hey, you can see that, you know, this is what I've done my sleuthing. There, yeah. there is a kind of trend of these kinds of works uh, at least in the last couple of years, evolution on the left, mixed up in the center with the amazing and more teeth, these teeth at the top here. It looks like something from an episode of the X-Files, uh, but maybe uh, talk a little bit about uh, the, the allure of this kind of totemic uh, conical form in your work now. Well, um, uh, hmm. well, you know, I was starting to, I occasionally do some sculptures that were uh, more abstracted, you know, but they also had mm -hmm. some um, uh, figurative components to them and I would mix it up. And so um, it used, they used to be on um, kind of 
well, there would be like a, a like a platform with some geometrical um, shapes holding it up, and then I would have other things, and then I would build on it like that. So it was open, and so um, I decided to try something closed. So that's how I arrived at this shape. Um, Looked terrific. And yeah, um, you know, I had this. Um, one day I was leafing through an art magazine and I looked at this George Kondo ad uh, for announcement for a show. And I thought, I wonder if you could do something like that in sculpture. <laughs> so, Why not? <laughs> so that I was, was going to ask you about George you know? Kondo. And I, I you know, it's not, yeah. it's not because um, of any like, um, well, I don't know. I don't want to say it at any rate. Um, <laughs> It just gave me this idea, you know, it was kind of, you know, sometimes you see something and you get an idea and you're kind of challenged by it. And um, so you try to see what would happen if you, if you attempted this, I guess. Very well explained. Yeah. I, I see the George Kondo loose connection in, in that sense, that sort of building up of disparate elements into head like forms yeah actually i thought his last show which recently closed i think at hauser and worth was oh. really strong uh, yeah. in coloration scale yeah. uh that it was the favorite my favorite works that i've seen uh by him but this has that kind of kooky uh, mutated element in these works and the one uh that we're talking about untitled here on the right is the one that has uh, a little bit of yarn so it's the one work that is not just clay uh, and glaze this piece Mm -hmm. A kind of poetic surrealist object, in a sense, with yeah. pegs so you can hang stuff on it. We should look at his show online, which we haven't done because... Yeah, check it out. It's, it was great. Yeah. It was great. Um, here's just some more details, like a wishbone, and uh, I don't even know. Uh, they're just whimsical, not whimsical because they're intentional, but they're, you know, the, the, colla the collation of elements is really interesting. Mm -hmm. And the coloration strikes me as a little fauvist, which I think is something that runs a bit through a lot of the works in the show. Yeah. Here is the uh, larger view of the back room, the second room in the exhibition, where you walk in and you're sort of confronted by all these works. They're all facing you, um, looking at you, looking towards you, even the sunflowers um, or whatever kind of flowers they are. And it's almost like you, you're walking into this space um, and the, these, these short trees uh, of individual installations of objects and forms. Um, and uh, these were crafted in your studio. They the Sauls have been busy this week photographing <laughs> for us to give you all a sense of uh, where they live and work and the environs. And uh, I have a few images that you sent me. So maybe you might talk about uh, the studio and how you work on different levels and the gardens that you develop. Well, this is er a bit earlier um, mm -hmm. than the interior ones I sent you. This is not winter. This is not winter, no. no. <laughs> There's a woodchuck this is trap. Wishful. There. If you see the woodchuck trap. Um, <laughs> no, where is that? Is that this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a Did you get one? Oh, it's a have a heart trap. We've oh, we just many, had, many. We had a big woodchuck problem. We had a lot of them. We caught 10 or 12. We became experts how, at it, you know. <laughs> how big are they? Well, huge, well right? they were big, really big, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to get someone to wrangle them out of the cage and then take them oh, no if you just well the way we had arranged it was i would bait the trap cantaloupe was especially um yeah they liked cantaloupe like. everyone likes cantaloupe and shrimp i think <laughs> yeah. two things everybody eats so the woodchuck like cantaloupe and then they go in and what happens well the door they trip uh the door and it closes on them and then uh, peter would take it to um the place where we would release release the animal and that was that you know until the next one came along <laughs> and finally what we did was we had some um wire um uh, put around the studio you um you know like um into like wire fencing that into the ground and that finally worked um because we just couldn't, you know, it just after a while, it just really became tiresome doing this all the what time. What do they do? They just dig and, and beat they up the They dig under the studio. And, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, they're kind of cute, really. 
I, I don't know, mind. I, I have nothing against woodchucks, but after a while, you know, um, <laughs> I, I don't it's think enough. it's great for the foundations or, you know, and, yeah. um, and there were so many after a while. So um, we decided we had okay. to deal with it. We're not the only okay. one. There's a lot of people. No, I'm sure it's pervasive. Okay. So, Sally, you work on the first floor? I do. Mm -hmm. Of this building, and Peter's on the second floor, yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. And this building was designed. Here's, here's the outside. It was yep, a studio when we first moved moved to Germantown. And, um, and uh, some years later, we had it vastly improved um, and more space raised um, so that the... Uh, second floor had a now has a lot more space for Peter to work mm -hmm. in. And mm -hmm. um, it was designed by um, Stan, Stan Allen, Allen um, Polly Applebaum's husband, who's an architect. Mm -hmm. And they have a place also in Columbia County. And so we were very pleased with it, actually. Um, right? That's right. Yeah. We like it a lot. So about five years ago, we did this? Five, six years, Great. six years, maybe. And this is the garden that a friend of yours helped you uh, get up and running? No, no, this is a garden oh. for a long time. The okay. little vegetable garden was the one that he he, he uh, planted, that Simon planted for me. Oh, okay, okay. And designed. Well, that's gonna come up later in the, in the talk. So uh, here's, the, this, is the, this is where the magic happens. Yep. Here's the kiln. Uh -huh. There you go. Yeah. And, uh, and here is, friend yep. Gertrude Stein yeah, yeah. And this is the Bose this is the Bose speaker that you used to for, to rock out the Gertrude Stein I made in Austin years mm. I, I had this idea about doing um, a series of presidents with um, a famous woman who lived there at the same time mm -hmm. and so I did FDR and Gertrude Stein <laughs> mm -hmm. I did um, uh, Thomas Jefferson and, and Sacagawea, I think, uh, is how you yep. say, pronounce her name. Yeah. And, um, and then Ronald Reagan and Angela Davis. And right. uh, I, you know, so at any rate, um, I had this show at Pioneer Works and Vivian um, Chu, who was the curator, um, wanted mm -hmm. to have some works from my Austin years and I couldn't believe it. So um, she contacted, before we left, I had given away a lot of things, you know, because we couldn't take everything with us when we moved back East. And so she contacted um, some of my Austin friends who had, had works and they were loaned for the show. And um, uh, the woman who owned this piece said that I should keep it. So I, instead of sending it oh, back, nice. I wound up with Gertrude stuff. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It, was, it was just amazing. That's so sweet. Yeah, it was yeah. so sweet. And, um, and furthermore, mm -hmm. the people who had, um, uh, you know, I didn't, you know, I just said I was going to give these away or something. And so they chose ones they wanted and um, they kept them so nicely, you know, mm. <laughs> I was amazed. Right. Uh, yeah. Maybe we can put in the chat a link, uh, so to the Pioneer Week Works show. That was Pioneer Works. It was called Blue Hills Yellow Tree, which mm -hmm. was, excuse me, a career <clears throat> retrospective that opened in May of 2019 um, of Sally's work. Yeah, you, you're making a, a, a hall of worthy American women. <laughs> yes. a, yeah, there is a great there is a great installation uptown. Um, at, uh, at uh, what is it called, uh, Bronx Community College. It used to be the NYU, New York University first campus. And they mm -hmm. have this kind of pergola of great Americans that overlooks the Harlem River. Uh, you can go there and it's little busts of all these great Americans. Of course, they're all men. Um, but, and then of course, Trump had this dopey idea at the, at the waning days of his term to make this monument, you know, this series of a hundred monuments of great American, oh. all genders and races, but just, you know, not where we're at right now. But this idea is really interesting to pair a president with 
yeah. a woman With, of the period. Yeah, I, back I sort to of it. wanted somebody who would you wouldn't think of immediately, you know, like Gertrude yeah. Stone and, and Roosevelt. With Schick, FDR. Era, yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, would they get along? Here's yeah. a portrait of a great American. Yeah. <laughs> how many how many portraits do you think you've done of Peter over the course of your career oh, since well, the eighties? I, I guess it's time for another one. Oh. Oh. <laughs> He thinks he looks ugly in this one. Stupid. Nah. <laughs> it's oh, and that, great. The, the, and the then, is I, I don't mind. And and the and the and those are chestnuts beside him. Oh, um, is that what that is on the bottom? Those are chestnuts because he has a um, an affection for chestnuts, and he like he carries a few in his pocket pockets because he feels they bring him good luck. And so right. you know, when he empties his That's pockets, fun. going through the. Um, the inspection area at airports, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They wonder about me. <laughs> all the stuff. <laughs> You're full of chestnuts. But how old are they? Well, that, I think that they're pretty old. I mean, they're old enough, so I've, we have a jar. Do they go them. bad? Do they go Five bad? years old, at least. Oh, you have chestnuts <laughs> that are older than that. Yeah, I'm 10 years old, maybe. Sometimes they have a little bug in them that gradually destroys yeah. the chestnuts. Interesting. In this case, some they haven't, I guess. Some some people collect Roman coins and some people collect chestnuts. There it is. Some right. Roman coins too. Actually, <laughs> you know, we There's lived in right we, lived, we lived in England for a year. There it is. Uh, uh -huh. From 1990 to 91, Peter had a grant year away from 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 the University of Texas, and so we wound up in a um, north of uh, London. Oh, maybe about an hour by train. Yeah. And what was the town, Sally? Well, we. Do you remember? Bunky. Bunky. It's a well-known town. A village just out. We lived just outside of Bunky and. Norfolk is where it was. And it, no, we were in Suffolk. Suffolk, not North. Yeah, uh -oh. but near the border. No, but um, okay. and we were near okay. the, the city of Norwich, and. Um, yeah. And so. That was just a, really an interesting year, really. Um, there was so much to see and look at, and there was so much, you know, you would think that we were very similar, but not really, you know, there's a, there's a lot of difference really between English, English and America, English yeah. people and yeah. Americans, and yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and the east part of England is, is very different to topographically, landscape. It and, is, yeah. You know, it's a beautiful, beautiful area. And that's not far from where John Constable was from. That's Great right. British romantic that's right. that's in the Stewart, in the Stewart River Valley. So when was that? How long were you in in, in England? For a year, for about a year. Mm -hmm. 1990. Mm -hmm. 1990. Lots of ceramics to look at. Like <laughs> the, I'm the, sure. the, Nor the Norwich Museum. Uh, yeah, the uh, castle. The castle, right? Mm -hmm. Dated from, yeah. from about eleven hundred, I think, and um, and it has the Twining Teapot Collection, and mm. it, it has yeah. many other things too in the museum, like you know, oh, ancient skulls with a battle axe. <laughs> yeah, that's. I want to do that exhibition, the Sauls in England. I mean, we need to do that show. <laughs> The Sauls of England. We can talk about that after. Talk about that later. Well, Peter Let is go part, forward a little. Peter is part English. Part I know. I remember that. I remember yeah. that. Here you go. Here's the studio at work with all the materials, and there's a bird or so, and um, and figures in the background. Now, do you work from uh, maquettes, from sketches, from small scale versions, or um, sometimes do you? I do. I do or drawings. Yeah. Uh huh. I had some idea about waterfalls, and so I ha did a painting of this one, and then I, um, on paper. That's here. Yeah, and then I kind of sort of d doing a maquette, and not really that satisfied. Just working it out somehow, you know. For and but I don't always do that, but I, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes I do. Yeah. So. And and like smaller versions that you play with the form and then do a bigger version. Yes, and then do a bigger version. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Huh. And and what's the you know you, you talked about using an underglaze uh, underglazes that you're working with what kind of clay? Oh, what kind of clay? Uh, low fire clay. 
um, earth, earthenware often, although I sometimes use white clay too. And um, my kiln is low fire. Um, I think sometimes about getting a high fire kiln or maybe a small high fire. Um, Why not? But um, what will that let you do? Um, uh, then I could use um, clay that has to be high fired like stoneware or porcelain and uh -huh. um, and then the glazes would be different. Um, the, you know, um, yeah. Have you always used the same type of clay over the last 30 I have, years? I have, yeah. You have, interesting. I like um, red. And, um, mm -hmm. I like a terracotta red. A terracotta, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wanted to show this because I think it's a nice sort of uh, way to see how your style has changed. Um, it is style uh, and, and surface and the way that you work with the material. So thinking about that using the same clay here on the right are two uh, works, effigies, one with feathers and one with skirt from the late 1990s. And then on the left is uh, a work which is in the present exhibition, Two Women. Um, you know, might just talk a little bit maybe about how your approach to the surface has changed over the last couple of decades. Well, uh, let's see. Um, well, I think it has become more painterly um, uh, in, in, in more recent times. Um, and that's partly from being able to use underglazes where I can mix the colors to, you know, to uh, have more variety. Um, mm -hmm. And also, um, hmm, well, yeah, I think it's from looking a lot at paintings too, you know, and so therefore I want to, it makes me want to actually also paint on the sculpture um, more than I did, I did before in earlier years. So mm -hmm. in that respect, I think it's, it's different. Um, and, and less inclined to use like additional fabrics and materials. Oh, well, um, yeah, well, not always. Um, I mean, I, you know, like um, on the one, the untitled piece, you know, I have some yarn and um, right. things like that in it. Um, and I think I, you know, every once in a while I think about using materials. I have, you know, like a, a, a sort of container of bits and pieces of material. So someday, so I'm approaching that, doing that again. So these little figures that you just saw, I made. Oops, those are those are um, Austin days, um, and yeah. I was influenced to some degree by pre-Columbian art um, effigies that I uh, they have they had quite a nice collection there at the mm -hmm. university, and looking at those um, influenced me. Let's look at some of the at birds. I think the birds are really standouts in these in the show big eagle uh here this one uh with the with the bits of uh orange which will show you what it is in a second or what it alludes to but i find the birds to be very serious in a way and very stately um and there seem to me wonderful opportunities for you to really work with the material and as you say work in a kind of painterly way uh mm -hmm. in this in this plastic form um, mm -hmm. while keeping it sort of rough on the surface and also use a great variety um, of colors. Uh, the big eagle, the bald eagle, which you've spoken before about how plentiful they are where you live uh, near the river um, mm -hmm. on the Hudson and you know how remarkable it is that we are a, the only country I can think of who has methodically both hunted and poisoned our national bird to the extent that it almost died. It was almost exterminated. That's a typical American trait, right? It's something wonderful and distinctive like buffalo and, and uh, yeah. eagles. And we try to get, Wipe them out. Try to get rid of them. <laughs> so they're coming back. And uh, I remember, you know, I have seen some since, but the first time I really saw them was up in Alaska 
and being just amazed at how big they were, how large they were. Uh, they the are. juvenile ones. Yeah. yeah. The juvenile ones with the with the brown uh, feathers, and then they change their um, change their form. So, uh, you know, maybe talk a little bit about this and your predilection for birds, and how long does a piece like this take you to, you know, conceive and then execute? Well, um, hmm. uh, for one thing, um, that you know, one thing that always takes me a while with birds are the wings for some reason, um, you know, getting them the way I want them. Um, uh, and then, you know, trying to represent um, a sort of feathery surface in some ways. So that always seems to take me the most time. Um, and the rest of it goes pretty quickly, I would say, um, after I get that figured out. And um, it takes, but it does take quite a, 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 a bit of time to address the surface, um, mm -hmm. you know, to put on the um, the feathers that takes a while and to have it the way I want it. And, um, but I've done, you know, I've done some of these before. So this time it was a little easier yeah. and yeah. Um, this went pretty quickly, actually. I just thought I had to have an eagle. And, uh, <laughs> yes. so, um, gotta have an eagle i had to have an eagle and Why i not? and um i like to have them sort of ruffled ruffled looking right and right. um mm. and the um and the orange alludes to trump's hair um because <laughs> right i mean i you know sometimes i like to think as i said before of the animals fighting back and mm -hmm. you know because I can't do it right. I like to think of the animals right. taking care of the matter. And, right. Um, right, and the eagle will consume eventually. Will consume. Well, and here's, here's Peter's wonderful painting, which was in the exhibition at the New Museum of the Abstract Expressionist Portrait of Donald Trump. You see that there, large scale mm -hmm. picture. Oh. That same orange, which we this is, yeah. don't have to think about as much anymore. You know, I didn't, um, you know, I realized suddenly at some point that what he's doing is he's painting him out of the picture, I think. And I hadn't. Um, I didn't I, think of that either. You didn't think of that either? <laughs> no, oh, but it, well, it's a good thought, idea, maybe. I mean. I always thought you were using the slime to shut him up, basically. Geez, I, just a floating head. He's hard <laughs> to paint because everybody's already insulted him completely. There's, there's yeah. not much of his body left that you can do anything. Right. Right, just this most distinctive part. <laughs> Here's the fabulous puffin. I love this uh, <laughs> puffin, um, some kind of sardine-like fish uh, yeah, in his sardine. beak. Yeah. Although it seems like it's sardines from a can, <laughs> but <Yes>. um, <laughs> puffin's got yeah. great coloration. And here, everyone can see how sometimes Sally uses uh, um, glaze to judicious effect there to highlight some elements in the sculptures. Puffin, and then here are the three, the oh, yeah. three great birds in the show, the great owl there on the right, and the owl includes a little bird at the bottom. What is that, a chickadee or something at the bottom? I think it's a nuthatch. Mm -hmm. Oh, it is a nuthatch, correct, mm -hmm. that's right, a nuthatch, typical New York bird. And I just wanna show everybody this image, and then I wanna flip it around and show you them from the back because they really look like these very formal figures standing like, you know, Abe Lincoln with his arms behind his back with his, uh, with his long suit, uh, you know, tail coat and very stately looking beings. I think the birds, yeah. the birds in the show have much more of a stable presence and mentality than lots of the figures, the people in the exhibition. I think that goes along with how you're talking about the animals will, you know, they know what to get, what to get up to. Their instinct yeah. tells them what to do. Yeah, what to do, how to take over. How yeah. to take over, yeah, trust, trust in the birds. Gosh. <laughs> so this is a real outlier in the exhibitions. Uh, one question about the birds really quickly, Sally. Are these hollow in the Yes, they, they are hollow. You know, I, I build um, with coils. Um, mm -hmm. So otherwise, you know, that would be, be so really a challenge. It would be very heavy. Yeah. 
could take them off and dry and everything else. Mm -hmm. So they're all hollow inside and then you just remove the material when they're finished. Uh, well, I just build up with coils, so they're hollow as I'm building, you know. Oh, I see. <laughs> so this is interesting work. So the part dollhouse, part, um, I don't know, Arizona uh, uh, outdoor stove, uh, part uh, oh, yoga, per person say. doing yoga yeah. <laughs> at the top called cabinet, which reminds me of the idea of a cabinet of curiosities um uh you know like a china closet where china cabinet where you keep all different kinds of things uh and these uh, objects these sort of mysterious objects inside from a shoe to i don't know this uh, i thought these were pieces of bacon or beef jerky um but it can be really anything right that you uh, well they're actually imagine. braids they're it's sort of difficult to see them but uh, they're okay. mm -hmm. can you take these things out like in a dollhouse and move them around well the braids you can, but the mm. uh, other pieces are affixed um, to the glaze. Um, so mm -hmm. no, you can't with those. Okay. And the woman on top, you can move, remove. Right. So this is a kind of female figure of contemplation who is seated on top of what, you know, looks like a sort of cutaway view of a tenement building or some kind of a three-story structure. Oh, I think that's a good description. I started off with something else in mind, but this is what it turned into. And I mm -hmm. decided I didn't want to think too hard about what I put in it. So um, to some, you know, to be, um, have it be a little more stream of consciousness, I guess, you know? Um, yeah. So that's what happened. Um, and so some things are just like, um, more abstract like these pieces here in the back and um, mm -hmm. then there's the the blue oval and yeah it's like an egg isn't it kind of like an egg yeah but not in part not entirely they feel like objects sort of suffused in memory and as if you know they're they're they exist there but they're also sort of in her contemplation yeah. that's true they are they are so, um, and I say that thinking of this next piece. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, yeah. Meditation tree in which you see a male figure mm -hmm. seated on some kind of a rock. Uh, comfortable rock uh, next to this tree, um, this great looming tree, which is an extraordinary structure, sort of part uh, asparagus top, uh, part uh, sort of redwood tree, part it reminds me also of those artificial trees with the you know with the with the uh, cell phone panels on top of them and the fake leaves coming off of them at the top they try to make that look like a forest but this similarly con contemplative image um, of a man here but without the objects of memory instead just in a forest well yes he he comes from a uh, I think 16th century painting um of john the baptist yeah right there mm -hmm. this one here yeah mm -hmm. yeah i did a little did a little hunting this is by uh uh Gertgen, uh tin uh, saint jean's or Gertgen from of harlem uh 1490 to 95 it's in the gamalda gallery in berlin mm -hmm. of saint john the baptist supposedly in the desert of yeah, course it looks totally. not very much like a <laughs> but of course, no one in uh, in Belgium had seen a, a desert before. So um, this is what he thought a desert looked like. But I pulled out all these images of melancholy from the history of art. So you have a little figurine here of uh, Ajax uh, mm -hmm. from the Iliad, uh, from Asia Minor, mm -hmm. first century BCE. Mm -hmm. And here is Munch. And here is Vincent van Gogh's portrait of Dr. Gaucher. And here is this wonderful painting uh, by um, Constance Charpentier, mm -hmm. French painter. Mm -hmm. uh, she was working in the Napoleonic or the, the consulate really, 1801 of melancholy. Mm -hmm. um, such a long tradition in the history of art of mm -hmm. these kinds of images, but- I th Thank you for me. these images, <laughs> they're great. Yeah, but yeah. no one's treated that it, it in such a sort of wistful way uh, as you have, I think. Of course you call it meditation, not mm -hmm. melancholy, but they're sort of intertwined. They're, they are intertwined. And, and I think especially in this one, um, the, you know, St. John the Baptist one, 
Um, mm. Well, he's, so he's I, got big know, decisions I, to make. An acquaintance sent, sent this postcard of this painting um, and I just kept it because I was so attracted to it and um, had it on my desk. And I, I, I really like his feet too. Look how slender his legs are. And yeah. his, his feet are... Um, yeah. it, he's wasting away. It, well, he just has one foot kind of on top of another. Um, just a, yeah. you know, he doesn't look studied somehow. You know, it looks like somebody just sat down and that's how they would sit, right? And mm. not being aware of being looked at, you know, I mm. guess. Mm. But I feel like the, the, your figure has a kind of hopeful expression on his face, depending yeah. on how you look at him. Yeah. And the tree, I've heard you say that there's something about paintings by <laughs> Derain, which, <laughs> you, which gave you- Thank you for doing gave this. Gave you a sense of the color, of course. This yeah. is what we do. This is what we do, but- uh, you know, and it's not the kind of paintings by Derain that you would expect, Fauvist works with bright, non-naturalistic colors. No, it's something closer to something more naturalistic, like in this image of Fontainebleau that you see there. So this, uh, this work, you've painted the whole surface of it. Um, and that's before firing, or do you fire them twice? I, fi I fired them at least twice. First, I bisque okay. fire, bisque mm -hmm. fire, which would note that's with no glaze on it, although you can, um, put glaze on a bisque, but it's, I mean, a pre-bisque, but at any rate, uh, it, so that's how I do it. And then I, and then I put the glaze on and then I fire again, and then I might fire again if I want some more mm -hmm. glaze. Uh -huh. Right, all right. I mean, you can fire many times, but. And this work is a couple sections, clearly. Yeah, it is. Yeah, right in the middle. Yeah, right. You know, I used to make actually much larger pieces, life-size pieces, mm -hmm. and uh, made in sections, maybe three sections. And, um, you know, I just don't do it anymore. It's too heavy for me to, to, to yeah. put in and out of the kiln. Yeah, yeah. I had one more of work, this one, which I think is <laughs> pretty special, blooming and feasting. Uh, feeding, sorry, blooming and feeding, um, which relates, you've said, to the garden that you that you've been working on, right? At your house, but these yeah. these little bugs there on the side, and then you don't notice the ones till you go behind it, and mm. you see the little bugs on the stalk. Mm. Yeah, but these are these are some serious stalks. They are really yeah. big, huh? <laughs> yeah, really big, serious, weighty stalks. I mean, yeah. they're like. They're like the stumps uh, in Roman sculptures, marble sculptures, those big heavy stumps that hold everything right. up. Mm. Pretty well, great. Yeah. Well, they have to accommodate all the insects, you know. Mm -hmm. So so this was inspired by the garden. Yeah. You know, it was last year was a very beautiful spring, I remember. Exceptionally. It was. And yeah. It was long and cool and just many shades of green, um, just the right amount of rain. Mm -hmm. And it was also very quiet because everybody was in lockdown. So there was no traffic, no machinery. Um, and you, you really heard the birds. It was, it was odd, you know, it was just, and, and there were a profusion of blooms when the flowers started coming out. There were things that bloomed that I had never seen bloom before. And, mm -hmm. Um, and so the garden for a while was just great, you know, and everything was moving along just fine. But then the weather suddenly changed and it became very hot and very dry for a very long time. And all these insects showed up yeah. and, um, you know, they just arrived suddenly. <laughs> they started eating everything. Yeah. And so then I was in a battle for a while and I, I became interested in them after a while, um, actually. I got to know them, I guess. Right. Right. And, um, and, and first I used um, sprays that were okay for an organic garden, but after that, well, I got tired of that. And so um, like with the Japanese beetles, I would just um, sweep them off the leaf into a container of water and soap and that took care of them 
and then you give them to Peter to take them to release them in a location. <laughs> in the right location. No, <laughs> I let them sink. <laughs> like the woodchucks. I let them sink no, well, I, well I th- and then they would sink. Yeah, we don't need so many so. of them. Um, I think it's, it was a common experience, I think, for people who are at least uh, like myself, who was, I, I was lucky enough to be able to go to Watermill uh, to a small house that we have out there from March. Mm-hmm. And to understand an idea which you're describing of slow time mm-hmm. as opposed to living in the city mm-hmm. and being really in touch with the environment for the first time mm-hmm. since I was a little kid mm-hmm. and seeing the minute changes every day that was going on in the landscape mm-hmm. and also realizing that the bugs mm-hmm. have like a, a, a great system. They have like a timeshare in a way that certain yeah, bugs yeah. appear for three weeks and then you don't see them anymore. And then there are different bugs that show up and different spiders. My children were horrified uh, and we were killing bugs. And I was like, this is interesting. When did these come in? And, and I'm sure it's gonna be the, it's the same every year, uh, right? But you just don't notice it if you're living in Manhattan or wherever or someplace where you're not in tune with nature and the bugs and the foliage and all of that. There did seem to be a, an abundance of them last summer yeah. for quite a while. and. Um, yeah. But we got along after a while, and actually the garden produced quite a bit, so it was okay if the insects had some too. And um, yeah, it's nice. Yeah, <laughs> and generous. I think that is generous, right? I think that's a theme in this show. I mean, we've we've been pointing it out uh, that the animals, the foliage, the natural forms in the show mm-hmm. feel abundant, feel like they are more settled than we might think, and they're in control. And it's, and it's the people who are at sea, right? And, and that's a, it's a, a beautiful, almost philosophical lesson that you're giving um, that the humans are the ones who are so, find it so hard to react, right? It's taken us so long to adjust mm-hmm. to this. Wear a mask, right? Um, that's part of the point of this sculpture here. How long it takes us to get it through our heads that, you have to modify your behavior um, or, you know, things are not going to work as you want them to, or as you're accustomed to them doing. The animals adjust very quickly. Uh, This work is called Hard Times, Hard Times, a very Dickensian um, title. Uh, And this woman who we already saw a detail of, but here she is with her askew, uh, beautifully glazed uh, glasses, uh, with her mask on, uh, form-fitting mask, with her discarded uh, uh, left hand glove and with the imprint of lipsticks or her, her mouth on the mask which gives her a kind of human quality and also sort of points up uh, the idea that you know the kisses that you're missing when you're masked up in this kind of environment um, there and she's very prim in her, uh, her in her gown with these three buttons um, but you know this this work kind of gets more at our condition over the last uh, few months than anything else in a way, and also the you know the the, the pressure that's been put on people, um, whether it's everyday people or uh, the the you know the providers and the medical and uh, medical professionals who have been tasked so much in this terrible time. I think this is a really beautiful oh, I work. I know that. I mean, they really you know when you think of. of I don't know how they do it, frankly, the medical workers, I don't. So at any rate, yeah. Well, this is when we first started wearing masks and you know, trying to figure how to arrange them just right and over mm-hmm. your glasses over them and mm-hmm. so things are a little askew and <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, your glass is fogging up. It's, yeah. It's yeah. People wear glasses. Can't see anything. Um, you have to become a mouth breather. Yeah, somehow. You can't see much of anything. They haven't devised that. And and also the mask is so inexpressive, um, you know, but it would be creepy to have a translucent mask, I think. Um, but oh, we're would. all learning to recognize each other by the top third of our heads um, <laughs> and through eyebrow movements and not always easy you know, the to corners do of our eyes. Not always easy, but I, I'm always surprised at how quickly some people that I haven't seen since March mm-hmm. will recognize me when we're finally face to face. Somebody not recognize happening. me. I said hello and they said, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you crave anonymity, it could be useful, yeah. right? Yeah. Go under the radar. Right. Hard times. Here's some details of this piece. Mm-hmm. 
and you could see like little bits like you know here on the hair there's just a little bit there that you've put the glaze on is that is that a directed use yes mm -hmm. i just lightly put some, uh, a, a brush you know that's like a wide fan brush and just lightly yeah. come on mm -hmm. yeah here and there yeah and, and it feels it gives you a, a sense of touch I think the glove conveys that here as well. The glove is wonderfully animated as opposed to all those sort of sad looking gloves that you see at least here in the city on the street that people just discarded. Or oh, really? Yeah. 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 I haven't seen that. Well, you know, at some point I felt that I really didn't need to wear gloves anymore. Yeah. So yeah. You just wash your that, many times. A there's day. that thing about there's a thing about lost gloves and mittens in New York where like you find one on the sidewalk and then you say, oh shoot, someone lost their mitten. So you put it on like a traffic meter when they used to have meters or, or a bike rack or something, hoping the person is gonna retrace his or her mm -hmm. steps and find it or the little kid that threw it out of the stroller will yeah. find it. But these gloves, right? These, the medical gloves, you see them on the street and it's just gross, it's disgusting. Oh yeah, it is. Just, don't wanna yeah. get near it. I know. They, it's, they don't feel it's as human. Dangerous for sure too, you know? Exactly. Yeah. That's why that Bernie Sanders meme, I think, had oh, such that, potency that, with him that's, that's wearing that. those mittens. Because yeah. you didn't need to see his hands. You had those mittens and they were so distinctive. They felt like a part of him. Somebody commented that he should be on the budget committee. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And he's got more attention through that than any of his campaigns. Yeah. So last, last works, uh, and then we'll open up to questions. Um, transformed, which we've already talked about a little bit on the left, uh, and caution on the right. I think, you know, these, uh, as opposed to the animal images where the animals seem like they're going about their business, here are people who are like the woman in Troubled Waters, uh, who, uh, the woman uh, that we showed you in the waves, uh, Troubled Waters, uh, they are at sea, <laughs> these people. They are discombobulated, uh, wall-eyed, buck-toothed. Uh, forgot to put on all their makeup or or jewelry. Um, the very expressive treatment of the painting, the painterly quality of the garments. Here, I'm going to show you the whole thing of caution because I think caution is caution is in, in two pieces. Um, it is right. Yeah, it's on top, right? It's just like the I didn't have a slide of it, but the charioteer from Delphi, the great mm -hmm. bronze charioteer from Delphi. Mm -hmm. um, which is a uh, early classical work, Greek work, and it's mm -hmm. fitted together the same way right here. It's joined at the the waist here, where mm -hmm. there's an overlap of his um, of mm -hmm. his garment. But oh, that's interesting. Pieces, huh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. but what is she doing? She's got a particular gesture there, like well, one hand out, the other sort of just expressing, you know, kind of a um, fear, a, a sense of caution. Be careful. Don't get too close. Mm. Watch what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I made a I made a figure similar to this that was in the Amin Red show, and um, I decided to do it again and um, make it larger. And mm -hmm. um, it's it's different from the one there, but um, I, I wanted a I wanted um, a figure that was somewhat different than the kind I usually do. So this is a someone who's Oh, I guess my idea was to look, a, well, sort younger and a little hip, you know, an earring and, yeah. and um, the, uh, mm, the type of pants, you know, kind of like tight jeans and a um, right. uh, top with, um, uh, well, a sort of psychedelic top, I guess, a little bit, you mm. know. Um, Is that a throwback to your 70s days in San Francisco? <laughs> Uh, maybe a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I want to talk about that. We'll get to that next time. Oh, okay. <laughs> get to that. The counterculture and the soul. Counterculture. Yeah, I lived in the Haight Ashbury actually. I I know it needs to come out. I think you knew you knew maybe that. That's that's another exhibition. Yes. Yeah. That's another I, exhibition. I, I wasn't we'll a to do. hippie. It was kind of by accident, and um, mm -hmm. but uh, I, you know, I realized at some point when our daughter was a. Uh, uh, in high school, um, I sort of mentioned this at some point um, to her and some of her friends, and I realized suddenly that I had this cachet all of a sudden you know, that I had had this experience. So at any rate, you never know when these things come in handy. Yeah, well, how many Grateful Dead shows did you see? That's the question. I didn't see any, but I saw Jimmy Hendrix. I saw Jimmy Hendrix. Oh, right. 
Okay, one Jimi Hendrix show is worth it. <laughs> Easily. Easily. Let's see if I have another image. Hang on a second. Oh, no, that's it. That's the last one. All right, caution. Well, I, I think it's a good place to stop and open it up to questions. Mm. Caution is the word, uh, no matter who's in charge at the White House. Um, and this woman is a kind of tot totemic figure for our times. But no matter how chaotic her mind is or her situation is, every toe is perfectly painted. Mm. Uh, every, she's, she's got her pedicure uh, that she hasn't neglected at all. Wonderful. So I know Sally, that's, thanks. That's important. <laughs> it's important. It, yeah. Well, the little things that keep us going, right? right? Sally, thank you so much, both for the exhibition, which I encourage everyone to go see in the last four days of its run, um, and for so generously sharing uh, with us today. And thank you, Peter, for being uh, the, your, her able, the, the Robin to her Batman. And um, <laughs> we appreciate it. It's great. It's wonderful to talk to both of you. Uh, anytime. You. We'll have you on anytime. I'm going to give it back to uh, Anya to uh, shepherd in the questions, and then we'll hear from Julian. But thank you so much, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stop Jason the share. and Sally. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, we're going to move into our, our uh, audience Q&A portion, and our first question comes from G.E. Schwartz, um, if you'd like to speak. Hi, greetings, and thank you so much. It's great to see you all again. <clears throat> Would you say your work um, is kind of reaching beyond satire to maybe being genuinely moved and by sadness to dismay and the absurdities of our of our history and uh, our strangeness overall? Um, well, yes, I think so. Yeah, uh -huh. I think I, I think I could say I, I could agree with you about that. Um, to, um, you know, I guess my work has a bit of satire is what I would say. And, and um, not only the pieces in, in this sh particular show, but maybe some other pieces that I've made more so um, than in this show. Um, I made a, a few years ago, for example, I made um, a Battle of the Centaurs scene um, from, uh, you know, uh, it, it, the description comes from Ovid of the Battle of the Centaurs, and it's just like over the top violence. It almost makes you laugh. It's, <laughs> it's so over the top, and um, so so yes, I I, I do sometimes look uh, bring a, a certain sense of satire I, to the to a piece. You're right. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from Julian Poirier you'd like to speak. Okay. Um, actually, Sally, I think you already answered this question. This my daughter had asked how, how long it took you to make the eagle. Um, Sam, you already pretty much it, but I did actually have one quick question. Mm -hmm. I, sure. I was looking at the work and it reminded me or, or put me in, in mind of, of this Brazilian uh, like folk sculpture that I saw when I was in Brazil. It's like a popular folk sculpture. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if you were at all familiar with that, you know? Um, uh, I don't think so. Um, can you describe it again? A pot sculpture, you said? It's a, like, a, like a popular sculpture of oh. folk figures um, in, in folk tales uh, in Brazil. Yeah. And You'll, you just find it in you, if you go into into like artisanal shops and stuff like that in um, in Brazil, mm -hmm. and it read, somehow rhymed a little bit with what you were doing. So I was just curious if you were familiar with it. <clears throat> I don't think so. I, I mean, I've looked at you know though at quite a bit of pre-Columbian art mm. and Native American art too. Um, so, but I, I don't I don't remember a, a you know Brazilian work that you're talking about in particular. Um, so hmm. yeah, have I'll, I'll have, have to look it up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I will. I will. When, as soon as this is over. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, our next question comes from um, Malvika. Thank you, Anya. Um, 
Hi, Peter. Hi, Sally. Hi. Uh, I'm so excited to see you again. This is so fun. Um, so I, I, I feel like it's no um, no secret that I really love your work. And I, I don't know, I, I just feel like it's very interesting how they're kind of little history objects and kind of like also talismanic, these kind of like, you know, like personal and political history and memory all kind of folded in together into a material uh, thing with a quality of thingness. And I was sort of wondering, you've touched on this already, um, similar to Julian's question, but I was wondering if you could sort of speak to the early formalization of your process and in coming into ceramics. Um, yeah, and how you sort of made that your yeah, like how did you formalize that as your as your form, and how did you sort of decide that ceramics was the was the medium? Well, you know, when I think back to when I was a kid, um, I remember a friend and I would sort of roam around in the woods and here and there, and you know, we I grew up in um, in the Finger Lake area of New York State, about ten miles outside of Ithaca, and so. There was a lot, when you were young, there was a lot of possibilities for exploring and so on. And so we, we found some clay one time um, and, you know, uh, you know, I can't remember where exactly, but it was just, we just sort of dug some up and, and made these things and let them sit out to dry, you know? <laughs> and so maybe that's where it began. But, um, but you know, um, after I met Peter and, uh, in the Bay Area, and um, uh, through mm -hmm. through him, um, uh, through his acquaintances among artists in the in the Bay Area, um, started to look at the ceramic artists. And at the time I met him, he was also making a piece with the um, ceramic artist Clayton Bailey, um, recently deceased. Um, he was working on the um, Mad Doctor piece. And so that was really my introduction. And I um, you, I just thought, oh, you know, I, I just, it was a world that opened up to me basically. Janet Kastner. And then, um, so gradually I was in a situation where I could, you know, take some classes and, and do more with it and so on um, over the years, um, especially in Austin. And so um, that's how it came to be. Really, I, I just felt, I felt good about clay, I guess. Um, Thank you. And I had a very good teacher too in Austin um, at the, in the ceramic, Janet Kastner, and she was a um, graduate of Alfred. And in fact, she and Arnie Zimmerman, who um, the ceramicist were both in the same class together. And, um, so I learned a lot while I was while I was there. Mm -hmm. Okay. She Thank was, you so much. That that, that okay. a yeah. lot for me. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Thank you for that background. Um, I have a question for you. Um, hmm? Just wondering if you have done or if you currently do any teaching. Me? No, I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't. Um, you know, years ago when we lived in Chappaqua, I uh, did substitute teaching in the high school, but not not with not with that was you know not clay, so <laughs> that was I guess my only experience really. Yeah. Do you, Sally? Do you work with any assistants, or it's just you in the studio? No, just me. No, Peter okay. doesn't have assistants either. Well, he has someone yeah. who helps who now who stretches. Um, the canvas and gesso's it, but um, yeah. I think it's difficult to have assistants because you have to organize your time. You have to talk to them. Well, that's not true. To, to do, but you know, I don't think management. You, you have She's to. More you have to organize <laughs> yourself carefully. So there are specific things they do when they come, and you know. Um, at any rate, what I'd really like is somebody to. Um, take care of my computer, <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> Peter and I struggle with this. She struggles, I could watch her struggle. For that's why you have kids. That's why you have kids that can deal with all that stuff. But yeah. then, they get, then they get older and they move out. Yeah. Yeah, so. mm -hmm. hmm. 
Uh, we have a, another question uh, from Lynn Crawford. Um, we'd like to ask. Oh. Lynn Crawford. Hi. Yes. Oh, oh, wonderful, oh. Uh, wonderful talk and wonderful work. And um, I kept thinking the whole time how a lot of the most of the time they seem to be sort of in between states. These figures, they mm -hmm. they weren't in the past or the future. They were sort of caught in this really interesting, mm -hmm. um, almost kind of like a, t a tension. And I wondered, I kept thinking about fairy tales and about modern fairy tales like Angela Carter. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever read her, um, The Bloody Chamber, or she's a British writer who reworks mm -hmm. ancient fairy tales into sort of modern versions. Mm -hmm. And I'm mm -hmm. just wondering if that's any of your inspiration. Well, it, you know, it might lurk in the back of my mind. Um, you know, I mean, I'm when I was much younger, I read all those, the Grimm fairy stories and the yeah. um, Hans Christian Andersen and and they were really grim. <laughs> so, do you remember the one with the uh, uh, the red shoes, was it? That where she um, couldn't stop dancing. Um, and so she had, her feet had to be cut off and, <laughs> it just was really <laughs> terrible, you know. Um, your, your work seems to be um, not, it, it seems to be like in some state of transition, uh, moving away from that. Yeah. Clearly, yet not 100% moving forward. It, it's sort of like contemplating right. what in between, between past and future might be. Oh, yes, yes. How I yeah. would, um would describe it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's what I sense. Yeah, it's so interesting to me how you catch that balance. It's such a deft, almost mm -hmm. fragile state that you catch where it's not. It references the past. It hints at the future, but mm -hmm. it's somehow mm -hmm. balanced. Maybe how to move into the future, thinking about it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. They're wonderful anyway. Thank you. That's an interesting idea. I'll have to think about that some more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next question comes from our very own Charlie. It's, uh, you're able to speak. Yes, uh, you caught me with a mouthful of burnt food. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation, Jason, and Sally, and Peter. It's really been tremendous, and. Um, yeah, so my question really, I was thinking about um, when you and Jason were talking about uh, how you will use maquettes or sketches to kind of work out various ideas before going into the piece proper. And I was curious how you think about um, issues of scale when you're making those decisions and, and taking a piece from a maquette to something larger. And also thinking about uh, a similar question about scale. Um, based off of, I, I haven't seen the show, but Jason's uh, installation shots um, really showed a variety of, of, of things at different shapes and sizes. So yeah, I'm just curious how you, how you think about scale when you're developing um, your sculptural work. Well, yes, that's interesting because the tree, um, for example, um, if I had wanted to have a person with the tree, um, I would have had to make the tree much larger, actually. So um, I realized that at some point because I didn't want like a really, you know, um, I mean, say the, uh, the piece called Caution, the woman, um, I mean, she would have been about as large as the tree. So, I mean, I mean, I could do that, but you know, it, um, that wasn't what I had in mind. So, um, these days, I think, and I have made much larger pieces. Um, but these days, again, I'm, I, I kind of limit myself in terms of, of, of lifting in and out of the kiln. And um, if I had a larger kiln, I could just, I suppose, wheel it in and um, uh, that would do it. But I, I don't feel, I don't, you know, I prefer the intimacy, I guess, of, of being able to work um, close to the piece and um, not to have it too large where I just can't make, 
um, handle it easily, I guess. So that's, uh, that's one um, determination of size for me. Uh, um, but on the other hand too, I don't like to just do very small pieces. I like to have a range. So uh, uh, um, a kind of a mixture. So does that help? Absolutely. It's really interesting to hear you, how you think about these things. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, sure. And thank you, Sally. Yeah. Um, our final uh, question comes from our very own publisher, Fong Gui. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anya. Thank you, Sally. Yes, where are you? I'm here. Oh, there you are. Okay. Thank you, Jason, for amazing conversation. So I have two two quick questions. One, you mentioned when you were um, with Peter in Bay Area, that must have been the time when San Francisco was sort of going through its uh, fun art movement. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, mm -hmm. I know that the, even though, you know, you might have relate, your work might relate to the, the California clay movement. And mm -hmm. I was thinking about Peter Volkers and mm -hmm. Stephen De Stapler and Ken Price, but those people are, are more invested in abstraction. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm thinking about people like Jazz, even though he's a painter, and then Wally Hendrick and Jim Nutt, they're all mm -hmm. painter. Mm -hmm. So the the only only sculpture that I thought of, of, of your work in the sense of touch, Sally, mm -hmm. is um, Robert Anderson, uh, just because he's a few people among the few who really was um, so much invested in figuration. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what, whether there was a, a friend, a relationship at all to, to uh, Anderson or through whom other people that, that you have met during that period in San Francisco? Well, um, hmm. you know, I think probably, um, uh, I was probably looking more at, at say, um, ceramic artists like Robert Arneson. Yeah. And, um, uh, and uh, Viola Fry. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember seeing um, an early work of hers of the standing woman um, and just being kind of surprised that anyone could do a, uh, do a sculpture of just a woman standing like that in an ordinary dress, right? Yeah. And, um, and then later, of course, she did those hu huge figures, looming figures. And so I think those were probably more um, influential in in when I actually started making work. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. Okay. And well, I also um, we lived in Port Costa for two years, so we were um, near Roy de Forest and his wife Gloria, and also um, Clayton. Clayton Bailey and his wife. And yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. well, we had plenty of opportunity to look at their work too. Yeah. Um, so roughly what time was this, Sally? Uh, this was um, 73 to 75. I see, wow, okay. Well, yeah. I, the, the next question is, is, uh, is the secret that you and, and Peter have managed to maintain for so long. Mm -hmm. I think of you to be in very, particular visionary types of artists or kind of artists. <laughs> you know, you, you don't let every outside influence to, um, to create intervention in the work. You know, you taught, you were in Austin for the longest time, mm -hmm. you stay true to your vision, mm -hmm. and, and it's remarkable to me. Mm -hmm. And it's very few artists couple that we know have that sustaining relationship, Leon Garlip, Nancy Sparrow being one example I can think of. Mm -hmm. But what the secret between two of you, mm -hmm. you know, because you're, <laughs> you're two different kind of artists, but you maintain a very lively rapport. There's some pictorial complementary going on. 
Huh. I can see it, but we don't have time to go into it. But I'm just well, asking. I'm going to think about what? this. <laughs> What's the <a> secret? You know, <laughs> you know, when you're together for so many years, um, it's just like he, it's it's difficult to imagine not being together, don't you think? Absolutely. Okay. It's so, physical. Yeah, yeah. It's like, and you even begin to look alike, kind of. You uh -oh. know, don't you think? <laughs> Peter. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that, that's true with couples who have been together for a long time they okay, begin to okay. resemble each other somewhat oh, God, all right. as if they're related you know uh okay that's fine <laughs> <laughs> oh, have good, good great race but no but is, is there i mean how often you would invite or ask peter to come in your studio and vice versa i mean do you still maintain that kind of uh well, that's no problem. He's upstairs and I'm downstairs and once in a while he'll come down or I'll go up, but it's not, you know, no. that's never been a problem really. No. Um, we get along he, okay. He, he'll he come some, you know, and he, whenever, um, I'll sometimes ask him about colors or something and, he, you know, he'll always be helpful. Um, yeah. I don't think we, I don't think we're really critical of each other's work, are we? Hope not. And so, um, yeah. we don't want to do that. Yeah. So, actually, we want to get along. That's the whole thing. We want to get along. So, we do it. <laughs> Good. I mean, we, we may be critical about other things, but not, not about mm. each other's artwork, I guess. No. We're supportive where we think we are. Good grief. I don't know. We never. <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Sally. That was. Oh, I want to know. There's oh, really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paul. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anya. Back to you. Thank you, Fong. Um, yeah, and thank you, Sally uh, and, and Peter, for, for being here together and bringing so much joy to this conversation, and Jason for facilitating such an excellent conversation. This has been really wonderful and invigorating. And, and we didn't uh, and we didn't have to use yeah. the other link. That's good. Yes, exactly. Uh, even it with the storm, <laughs> the connection yeah. stayed strong. So um, it stopped snowing now. Mm -hmm. It stopped snowing. Yeah. I can't see out there. Yeah, yeah it's, it's still pretty pretty white um, outside, but no snow. Uh, so yeah. at the rail, we have a tradition of ending our lunches with a poem, um, and it's uh, coming towards the end of our program. Um, we've carried uh, that tradition of uh, poetry into these um, online community events. And today I'm thrilled to welcome our Poet Laureate of the Day, Julian Poirier, to the stage. Uh, Julian is the author of Out of Print and Night Mail, an ongoing series of poetry and comics broadcast by the U.S. Postal Service. He was a founding member of the Ugly Ducking Press Collective. He lives in Berkeley and teaches poetry at San Quentin State Prison. Wow. Uh, so Julian, the floor Punch. is yours. Oh boy, we get a poem now. It's like dessert. Hi guys. <laughs> Thank you. I very much enjoyed that. It's been nice hanging out with everybody. Um, I'm going to read a very new poem. Um, still just in my notebook. When someone has the runs, I'm not disgusted because I put myself in their shoes. But when someone says their political enemies are running a child trafficking ring out of a pizza joint in DC, I shrink from empathy with primal aversion. But that's what you get when you've been shafted the rinds and ribbons of a moral relativity banquet at the long table through fairy woods. The meat of wild game leaping lawns of the top schools on earth dies on the bone of conspiracy to replace the strong through venal wile. And after all, faith is tougher than evidence, no matter what they say. As for supplements, these days I'm really only interested in those that make me feel like a pussycat in the citrus groves of the astral plane. Stay focused, 
be as smooth as the information superhighway that no wild creature in God's kingdom would dare cross for fear of being atomized, Blitzen's word, by a vast conspiracy? The rain, a conspiracy to make us wet. The wind, a conspiracy to make us fly. The sun, a conspiracy to wake us up. Lead belly is dead, but his word is law. The law states you've got to walk backwards all the way through Utah. Somewhere along the way, I seem to have lost your sense of urgency and took off before that stick with sleeping red thorns interceded halfway to Peru, the coast your shirt off, and the final vestige of our dinner party crackled to the floor. <clears throat> Mel and Allison, Janet Frenetti, and Paul with his convertible Jaguar. Jane stuck leaves to the stick with rainbow wax. I touched a poppy to Christo's fence, burned a little hole. America is a great nation of consumer products. Why can't we make Congress act more like Whole Foods with a pyramid of silver apples at the end of every aisle of delicious organic laws? Why can't the health system be more like Amazon Prime? Cheap primary care delivered right to your door. The last singing telegram is about to die unsung in an old age home in New Jersey. And that Ann Peebles record is going for 75 bucks on Discogs. But if funkiness shimmers from one windfolded California poppy to the next, I mean, it's free. Thank you. Is that in a book? What's that? Is your poem in a book? No, I, I just wrote it a few days ago. Maybe it'll make it into a book. Who knows? Okay. okay. I hope so. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that was excellent. Very good. So good. Thank you, Julian. Thank you so Thanks much. So much. Thank you. And thank you, Jason and Sally and Peter for being here today. Um, this has been a wonderful conversation. Uh, thank you all who tuned in today and for your questions. Uh, this October marks the Rails 20th anniversary um, and we'll be uh, celebrating all the way um, into um, and through 2021. So please consider making a year end contribution to keep the rail and our special projects free, relevant and independent like um, the uh, new social environment lunchtime series um, and our We the Immigrants project. Every amount matters to us. Our goal is to double um, last year's participation and reach 500 donors. And you can check out the chat for more information or ask one of our team. Um, and join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a radical poetry reading with Bob Holman featuring political poetry read by Samantha Thornhill, Dewey Prizer, Nancy Mercado, and Mohammed Hojib. Uh, and you can now uh, turn on your microphone and say goodbye as you leave. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Thanks Sally. for coming. Thanks, Sally. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Jason. Thank Thank Julian, for your poem. Great. Great poem, Julian. Thank you so much for that dessert. We love it. <laughs> It was a beautiful reading. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was. It was. Yeah. Yeah.